Good afternoon, and welcome to um, One Care's Grand Rounds on the annual wellness visit. I'm Susan Shane, family physician and uh, medical director here at One Care, and we are very pleased to um, have you join us for this, um, our first Grand Rounds. Um, we brought together some subject matter experts to share their wisdom with you on this topic. Um, this is a new form for us. Um, as I said, um, we're calling it Grand Rounds. We um, will be meeting for 90 minutes. We will have three presenters um, and sufficient time at the end so that you can all ask questions. So I'll ask you to hold questions until the end. Um, and, and yet we do have a chat box available, so you're welcome to type those in as um, you think of that get to them at the end. Um, as I said, this is the first of our grand rounds. We'll be doing this quarterly, and we can um, let you know um, of, of the other dates and topics. So for those of you on the phone, um, I might ask you to mute unless you um, would like to say something. A lot of times we've noticed some feedback um, if we have no, not, if they're not muted. And for those of us in the room, I just want us to be mindful of making sure that we speak into the microphones. But if you on the phone are not hearing us well, please don't hesitate to let us know. So today, um, if you, let's see, do I have the clicker for the agenda? Can, I'm hoping that you've all um, gotten into the WebEx and that you can see um, our slides. And if you don't, we might need help. Okay, you should be. Can you all? Can anyone just tell me if you can see the slides? Yep. Great. So here are web details. Um, you know, if you if you enter your name and email address, um, we will be happy to um, make sure that you're on the list in the future. Um, also, we are uh, hoping to send um, you an email evaluation at the end to see how we might um, improve this and what worked well. Um, so this information is right here. Um, again, I'm Susan Shane, and um, let's just review the agenda. We will um, be need we will be hearing from um, three of our um, presenters. The first is Jeremiah Eckhaus who's a family physician and uh, co-chair of the Community Alliance for Health Excellence. He's at, with the Integrative Family Medicine Practice in Montpelier and will presenting a case study on um, how the annual wellness visit has been implemented in their practice. Give us some highlights on strategies for success, how some challenges were overcome, um, and also review the staffing needs and the return on investment. Um, our second presentation will be with Dan Moran, who is an APRN at Dartmouth uh, Internal Medicine Department. He is, um, also works at the Dartmouth Center for Health and Aging and is part of the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program there. He'll be providing us with an overview of the training involved um, with the teams that are implementing the annual wellness visit into a practice. Um, with a brief overview of what their program at Dartmouth is and um, how they've been running boot camp sessions for mm -hmm. to help them with this implementation. And lastly, we will have Liz Sheehan, an RN at the Aichi Health Center, which is part of the Mount Escutney Hospital um, and Health Center. She'll be sharing her experience of um, becoming a, a provider of the annual wellness visit having gone through the, um, the boot camp or the course with, um, with Dan Moran. So I am going to um, just start by just um, giving a sense. I think most of us on the phone are aware or are familiar with the annual wellness visit, but I just want to everybody was on the And if those with dogs in the background could mute, we would. <laughs> So um, 
let, let me just say that the annual wellness visit is something that we here at uh, One Care have been thinking a lot about. Historically, um, it was underutilized in our network. When we first looked at this in 2015, 18.7% um, uh, performance um, on this. So there was certainly a variation among providers, um, among practices, and we made it one of our priorities. We also developed a um, toolkit for the annual wellness visit and posted it on our portal that um, anyone in our network could access. We've promoted it at committee meetings, clinical advisory boards, consumer advisory groups, presentations to providers. But in 2016, our numbers were you know, up to only 24%. So we were delighted when Jeremiah Eckhouse commented at a committee meeting here at OneCare that his practice was now utilizing a nurse to um, a nursing model for this to do their annual wellness visits and you could just feel the interest in the room. It really, it really was palpable. So we thought, what an ideal topic for the first of our Grand Round series. So let me, uh, again, uh, quickly just review um, what is the annual wellness visit. So this is um, a Medicare program. It's a free preventive care service that's available to the Medicare beneficiaries since 2010 with the Affordable Care Act. It's a visit that's focused on prevention, safety, and coordination of care. It is um, definitely different from the welcome to Medicare physical or that initial preventive physical exam. This does not include a physical exam. It does include, however, a health risk assessment, establishment of an individual's medical and family histories, and a list of their current providers, measurements of height, weight, body mass index, and blood pressure, screening for cognitive impairment, depression, functional ability, and falls risk. It provides a written screening schedule and a list of risk factors to the individual, and it includes a personalized health advice and referrals as needed to um, health education or preventive counseling services and programs. Who's eligible for this? Um, as I mentioned, it's for uh, Medicare Part B um, beneficiaries who have been um, a beneficiary for at least 12 months. And it's for those who have not had that welcome to Medicare physical, or at least it's been 12 months since they had it. Um, any subsequent wellness visit? Um, well, this is, this is an annual but it has to be at least 12 months since your previous annual wellness visit. And um, again, Medicare pays for only one initial or first annual wellness visit per beneficiary per lifetime, but then pays one subsequent visit per year thereafter. And those of you in the room, if any of my information is not up to date, please let me know. Um, so why did we make this a priority? As I mentioned, or here at OneCare, um, our performance <laughs> rate was not good in 2015. We were really looking for improvement. Um, certainly, you know, it's a benefit to our patients. We'd like to um, think that we're doing primary and secondary prevention with um, real focus on chronic disease. It will um, help identify and close gaps in care, in their preventive care. Um, it also, um, by doing this visit, you do hit uh, a number of the Medicare quality measures. We can go over those if anyone has questions. And um, it's a nice way to maximize the attribution of your Medicare beneficiaries. And um, as you know, we think of healthcare reform and having these uh, attributed patients, it's nice to have some of the sort of well patients or people that are not needing as many services. Um, but often those folks might not be coming in because they're well and they don't really think to come in with um, acute issues, so they might be lost to this benefit. It's also an opportunity for accurate coding and population risk adjustment. So again, when payers are thinking of um, either providing a per, per member per month payment to you or um, thinking of, of a reimbursement, they are often using some sort of um, uh, 
risk adjuster, Medicare or CMS uses a hierarchical condition category, and the higher the risk of your patients, the higher that funding. And so it's important for us to be thinking of um, making sure that we're listing all of their, uh, their medical issues. And of course, it, it's increased um, primary care revenue. So now I'm going to hand it over to Maya Eckhaus, who will be speaking to us about his experience. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for the invitation to come here today, and thanks Emily for inviting us. And I want to thank um, the folks at Dartmouth for putting together the program to, to help get this going. And not last, but not least, I want to thank Tina DeMassey, our wellness RN, for being here today to answer any questions that folks might have. So as Susan mentioned, I'm a family practice physician working in Montpelier. And I'll just go over what we did. So the objectives for this discussion today, I'm going to talk about a uh, project overview, implementation process, and workflow, and then some outcomes. We'll review some challenges and some next steps that we're looking forward to. So this is a little bit of information about our practice. We serve roughly 6,000 patients in the central Vermont area. Our 65 plus population is about 1,000. And we have three family medicine physicians in practice. We have three family nurse practitioners and one clinical psychologist. So when I was putting this talk together, I asked myself the question, why did I do this in the first place? And because it is some work to get a new pro project off the ground as you all know. Um, but this was really something that was bothering me. And when I looked at my data, we, we were doing a little bit better perhaps in terms of the percentage, but still only about 30% of our patients were getting annual wellness visits. And I thought, you know, that's, that's really not very good. The other thing is that, as you probably all know on the phone, when patients present for their annual wellness visit, they come with a list of medical problems, concerns that they want us to address. And it's very difficult to then focus on the prevention when you have to deal with all these medical problems. So these concerns are usually either addressed for free or it generates a separate visit code that's not covered for, it's not a covered benefit for most of these patients and, and that generates some un unhappiness about the bill. Um, so the whole thing just becomes very difficult. It's also challenging for time-wise to get it all in. And then that ends up causing dissatisfaction among the clinicians. So I was very excited when I heard that, that annual wellness visit was going to be part of the, um, the geriatric workforce enhancement project, which we'll get to next. So the project objectives for us, we wanted to improve the quality of our annual wellness visits. Um, oftentimes I felt like the documentation wasn't there. We weren't getting all the, all the um, items met at each visit. Um, the other issue was the clinician job satisfaction and improving that. Wanted to increase the number of annual wellness visits, improve and maintain high patient satisfaction, free up the MD and APP's time for other types of visits, increase the number of Medicare covered preventative screenings being completed, and increase revenue for the practice. So as far as the implementation process, we were one of the first practices to participate in the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Project. And I'm not going to talk about this in much detail right now because it's the next presentation. But the initial kickoff for this project was in February of 2016, and we began our annual wellness visit pilot design in A, and then initiated our pilot in our practice in December. The Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Project provided training for our, for our nurse and for our clinicians. We created a new job description for a current nurse to take this on as part of a new position known as the wellness nurse in the practice. And we created an annual wellness visit template in the EMR based on Dartmouth's template to help make sure that we covered all the, all the um, 
bullet points in the annual wellness visit. So the first thing that we did was educate Medicare patients by sending letters explaining the new process. We educated our staff about the process and what the Medicare annual wellness visit is and is not. And there is a lot of confusion out there, um, not just among patients, but among staff about what the annual wellness visit is, and more importantly, what it is not. We developed protocols for the RN related to screening lab tests, physical therapy referrals for fall risks, et cetera, so that it really empowers our nurse to be able to <coughs> intervene when she finds something with some of the screenings and actually take some action. And patients have the option to schedule a problem-focused visit with their PCP or an annual wellness visit with the nurse. So they're given the option. They don't have to do an annual wellness visit, but they're given that option. And then it, if they come in for a problem-focused visit, that gives us an opportunity to provide some education about what the annual wellness visit is and how it adds value to their care. At the annual wellness visit, the RN identifies gaps in preventative care, and often a follow-up appointment is scheduled with the PCP if it's deemed appropriate. The RN then sends the PCP a note summarizing the findings at the annual wellness visit for feedback and recommendations. You heard Susan mention that it's important to capture diagnos diagnosis codes at these annual wellness visits so that we're actually um, getting an accurate assessment of the risk. And that's one of the things that our wellness nurse is able to do. Tina notes that something's not on the diagnosis list, on the problem list, she can add it. And then by sending us a note uh, back to the PCP, we can then verify that that is in fact correct or if it needs to be changed. So this is a typical summary note that I might get from my wellness nurse. This is actually an actual summary note. Um, and this is a patient that had no advanced directive on file, so she gave a copy for completion to take home. Uh, the labs were due for this patient, probably had high cholesterol on the history and maybe was on a cholesterol medicine but hadn't had labs done. And because of our protocol, she's able to order those. Uh, this was a former smoker who had an ultrasound done, and that was normal, so she just documented that. Uh, the eye exam had not been done in 10 years, and so she recommended a referral a dental exam as well. The body mass index was noted to be high, and so Tina actually referred this patient to our uh, community health team uh, wellness coach for uh, diet and exercise coaching. And a pneumococcal vaccine, PCV13, was given at the time of the appointment. This is another part of the note that I think was really um, important. She can just put in a little bit of a, a dialogue about um, pertinent information. And so I thought it was interesting this, this patient was difficult to obtain family history, um, and there's some history here about the patient was left by the father and by the mother and was in foster care, uh, also without a relationship with his own children, and English bride took the children and left the country. So, you know, there's some details here, but I think as a family doc, this is the kind of detail that I really like. Uh, I like to know these things about my patients, and it really tells you a little bit about how this person might be a little bit isolated. Um, they're getting older in, in their years, and kind of brings to, um, to the forefront some of the important issues that might be coming. Um, so I did a little bit of math just to kind of understand what our return on investment might be. This is using an average RN salary of $66,520 a year. With an average salary, the break-even point is 50 annual wellness visits per month or approximately two and a half visits per day. Our current Medicare annual wellness visit reimbursement for our hospital is $114. And our current reimbursement for 99214, just to compare, for Medicare is $85 and for commercial it's $205. I wasn't able to get Medicaid information before this presentation. But um, for a one hour annual wellness visit, the practice net profit by provider type would be um, $83 for that hour if an RN does the visit, $67 if a nurse practitioner does the visit, and if the MD does the visit, $24. So if, if an MD performs two 99214s per hour, 
the RN does six annual wellness visits per day, assuming 210 work days per year, the average return on investment could be about $400,000 per year for the practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I really like the way you do that with the the that statistic. <clears throat> so, um, just a little bit of information about patient satisfaction, and we're in the process of gathering this data. We are only six months into our process right now, so it's kind of early. But we have some some anecdotal. Um, information. We did do some surveys and, and got some feedback from patients. One patient said that they appreciated the thoroughness of the interview and receiving a copy of all the information that we went over because there's a, Tina can speak more to this, but there's a summary of the visit that's given to the patient. Uh, the nurse spent a lot of time with me and was incredibly thorough. I will do this again. My PCP never seems to have time to cover all these things. <laughs> there's truth. I learned some new things about eating healthy with diabetes. So this, our wellness nurse is able to do some education as well around diet and, and diabetes and those kinds of things. As far as the um, MD and advanced practice provider satisfaction, some quotes, this allows me to focus on the issues that patients have and not feel like I am missing the preventative stuff because I know it is getting done by the nurse and the wellness visit. I find the focus visits after the patient has had an annual wellness visit to be quite rewarding. Patients are coming in to talk about specific questions related to their advanced directives or other issues found during their annual wellness visit, and we are able to devote the time to those things. Conversations are meaningful and less distracted by the requirements of the annual wellness visit. I think it's been positive and patients seem to like it. It, it frees me up to see patients for other types of visits, so very similar types of feedback from different clinicians in our office. So um, just a couple of examples of how this might be improving quality for patients. Um, this is one example of a 79-year-old male with a history of smoking, never had a AAA screening done despite being seen by the MD three years ago for an annual wellness visit. Um, so when Tina identified this patient, having a gap in care, she ordered a screening ultrasound and found a 4.6 centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm. She also noted that on the mini-cog, the patient scored a one, and so she did a MOCA, which uh, scored a 10. That's the Montreal um, Cognitive Assessment. So those scores are quite low. And she then referred the patient back to the PCP. At that time, the PCP diagnosed the patient with depression pseudo-dementia and started an SSRI, so the patient began treatment for that. Also referred the patient to vascular surgery and started surveillance for the AAA, um, which is exactly what we want to see happen for this, this kind of patient. So that was a great success story. This is another one, a uh, 74-year-old formerly homeless patient with infrequent visits to the PCP, never had any preventative medical care, but was referred to the Council on Aging Community Health Team, Washington County Mental Health, SASH Services, was re referred for all sorts of community services when she came into the practice, but had never actually had an annual wellness visit. And she was contacted through our panel management process because we identified patients who had not had their annual wellness visit. She uh, took us up on that and came in and saw Tina for her annual wellness visit. And this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> So the patient had no advanced directive, big surprise, uh, no mammogram on file that was ordered in, uh, per the protocol, she's able to order that to be done. Uh, bone density was done in 2012 and indicated osteopenia, so that was repeated. Um, labs were done the prior year and it looked like the patient needed some more labs done because they hadn't been done. A time up and go test was completed and that was um, a score greater than 12. So the patient was immediately referred to physical therapy for falls risk. Uh, the patient was referred to a dentist because she lost her dentures three years ago and hasn't been eating healthy food since that time. Uh, also referred, referred to our community health team to assist with diet, meal planning, and shopping. Referred for an eye doctor, doesn't remember the last time she went. 
currently wearing over-the-counter glasses but having visual difficulties. Um, there were multiple diagnosis, diagnoses added to her problem list, including gait instability, poor diet, mild depression for the PHQ-9, and missing teeth. And the last bullet <laughs> item um, is particularly important. Uh, would appreciate a chance to discuss this patient with you. So this is this is just a great example of how the patient's co not coming in to see the PCP for the preventative visit, but was contacted, came in for a wellness visit, and an opportunity now for the nurse to communicate with the PCP. We need to have a little bit more discussion because this was a very complicated visit with lots of gaps in care. And I will say that it resulted in a, in a good conversation. And here's some of the things that happened. So the patient was reconnected with SASH, and a lead care coordinator will be identified so that the patient doesn't fall through the cracks again. The patient will follow up with a PCP, and that was scheduled, actually, at the time of the annual wellness visit. And we discovered a new diagnosis of diabetes that was, to this point, undiagnosed. There were transportation barriers that were identified as well, and a plan has been made to transfer the care of this patient to a PCP office closer to where she lives in the fall, if possible. That's something that we're trying to coordinate with one of our other practices. So this project, um, despite some successes, was not without challenges. I would say that the biggest challenge was the culture shift. Um, patients are used to and expect to see their PCP for an annual physical. And that's just what we've traditionally done, so that's what patients expect. So this shift to, to an annual wellness visit was really uh, difficult for a lot of patients. So we, we did some front desk scripting and had them follow the script when talking with patients. Um, that was partially successful, but not completely successful. We still had problems and issues that arose. We scheduled follow-ups with the PCP after the annual wellness visit, and that allowed for some of the issues to be addressed and improve patient satisfaction. We also socialized the new process with patients at other visits whenever possible. I find that I'm still doing that a lot, talking to patients about what is the annual wellness visit, why have we transitioned to doing it this way, how does it add value and improve quality. There's still confusion about what an annual wellness visit is, <laughs> and we actually found that in the short term, what we've been doing is Tina, our wellness nurse, is actually making the initial call to schedule the visit so that she can answer questions about what is an annual wellness visit, why is it being done by a nurse, and that's really helped a lot. We feel like over time, as patients get used to this new process, that that won't be necessary because it is very time intensive. It takes a lot of Tina's time. Yeah. I don't know if you could hear that, but she said that, that we are transitioning that to another nurse to do that, those phone calls, because it's taking up too much of her time. Um, but this increased the number of patients that accepted the annual wellness visit significantly. Some billing issues and confusion around that. Um, I think this was already mentioned by Susan, but the initial uh, physical needs to be The annual wellness visit can be no sooner than 366 days from the first IPPE. Could, could I just ask that folks think about muting their phones? We're getting a lot of um, feedback here. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. So, um, we, we improved our information letter that went out to patients, and we, we got some patient feedback on that letter, and we're able to change it and improve it, and that, that was helpful. And we're working on a process for the practice to refer patients to a financial counselor when needed. This actually came from out of a complaint that we had, uh, a patient complained to Bernie Sanders about our new process. And uh, so we got a phone call from Bernie Sanders' office and decided that we would take that seriously and actually uh, get some feedback and come up with a new process. So um, updating the problem list, I already spoke about that. 
and, and, and how we're able to do that, I think that's an important aspect of this as well. Some next steps, we need to evaluate the data. Um, the percentage of patients with Medicare that had an annual wellness visit, as I mentioned at the beginning, were somewhere around 30%, and we need to continue to follow that over time to see if that improves pre and post intervention. And then the health risk assessments, currently they are completed during the visit. Our hope is to have them completed before the visit, and that may save 15 minutes off of the visit so that we can then increase the return on investment. Could I ask, did you try sending them to them beforehand, and then did that not work? Um, the schedule is so close to the time that they're seen that to get it in the mail, so our process is that it goes up to the hospital, then it's mailed out. Um, there's too much of a lag time. They may get it before their appointment or may not. So, thank you. But in the future, we hope to be able to get that completed. And some patients are able to, you know, use the computer and may be able to complete this through the patient portal. That's another possibility. Um, we need to continue to utilize panel management to identify and recruit those in need of an annual wellness visit, and then roll out the project to other practices within the network and share what we've learned, which is what we're doing today. Thank so you. thank you very much. Are we going to hold questions? Or thank you. Questions? If it's okay, we're going to hold questions because um, the questions that are asked might be appropriate for all three of you okay. panelists, Great. if that's okay. I, I would like, before I introduce Dan again, I just would like to comment that um, Emily Bartling is the um, clinical education coordinator here at OneCare who has coordinated all of this. You may um, have gotten emails from her or you may in the future as she is working on um, obtaining some CME for our grand rounds. So thanks to Emily for this. And thank you very much, Jomai. That was a great kickoff. And now Dan Moran will um, tell us more about his program at Dartmouth. Um, I'm Dan Moran. I also want to let you know that I'm sitting here with Ellen Flaherty, who is the co-director of the Dartmouth Centers for Health and Aging. So she might... Uh, present a couple of the slides here just to give you a little bit of information from that. Uh, so you might hear both of our voices as we move forward. So basically, um, we're going to talk a little bit today about what a GWEP is. That's a Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program. How we decided to try to transform the team. How we provide ongoing support and our successes and our lessons learned as well. So our motto at GWEP is making it easy to do the right thing. So that is not any of us. Those are all our actors, unfortunately. <laughs> so do you want to talk a little bit about GWEP? Sure. So GWEP is one of uh, 44 federally funded geriatric uh, training initiatives, and um, many of you may know that these were formally called geriatric education centers. And this uh, funding that began in 2015 really focused on uh, transforming primary care around geriatrics. And uh, a big part of this was thinking about sustainability. Many of you know grants come and go and people do great work and then when the money dries up, everything goes away. So when we thought about sustainability and really recruiting practices, we thought about uh, supporting practices and helping them to be able to use the Medicare billable codes. Um, and so the focus of our program is really on these four categories of coding. So we, and Dan will talk a little bit about how that's implemented, but so this was pretty intentional that we decided to focus on, on, on these components of what we're considering best practice um, using the Medicare codes. Do you want to talk on this a little bit? Or? Sure. So uh, when we first started out, the first thing we, we thought about is, is the structure of the program and bringing the teams together at, at a kickoff meeting. We were fortunate enough in the first year to do this um, along with the uh, annual Dartmouth co-op meeting, which is the primary care research network out of Dartmouth that includes practices in Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. 
Um, so we had a full day of kickoff of in-person training. Um, and part of this was also helping practices to think about how they would partner with community and social services. So certainly SASH in Vermont, Service Link in New Hampshire, and then helping practices to think about how they actually use patients and families to help transform this care. We provide um, quality improvement training, um, focusing on using PDSA cycles, and again, helping practices to understand through some stimulation, um, not only about the annual wellness visit that Dan will talk about, but about some of the other programs, chronic care management, team training that we do, um, and how we use patients and families to help with that training. Go ahead, Dan. Okay. So uh, we had our kickoff, and that's where everybody got together all at once. Uh, and then after that, we ran uh, individual uh, boot camps. So we had four boot camps. Again, one was around the annual wellness visit, one around chronic care management, one around dementia, and one around uh, advanced care planning. So I'm just going to give you an example of what the annual wellness visit training boot camp looked like, and we're going to focus on that. But we did this same thing for those other three services as well. So again, this was another full day in-person training. Um, and basically we started off with just some informational stuff about the annual wellness visit, uh, rules and benefits. Uh, then we introduced our Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program's website that we've created to help support this stuff. Uh, then we would talk a little bit about uh, risk assessment and note templates. So as we come to find out, this is a big challenge for a lot of sites. So we really took this job on and uh, really came up with what this uh, risk assessment needs to look like and what a note template might look like. Uh, then we reviewed our annual wellness video. We, we created a video to sort of give a little supporting information and a visual of what some of this might look like in the clinic. We would end with uh, some questions and answers about that. So we'd have a panel discussion. We'd have all the appropriate people up front in the room and just let uh, the clinics go ahead and ask all sorts of questions. Then we introduced a little bit about learning collaborative. So uh, eventually we had some sites uh, learn this information going forward <clears throat> in a learning collaborative fashion. So this was done through webinars where some sites got site-assisted implementation. So it was us sitting next to them, elbow to elbow, and this is what Tina and Montpelier's practice got. So they got a lot of uh, my time and I got a lot of windshield time. So, um, and then basically talk about the next steps in practice, how we can go ahead and help move this forward. So with the ongoing support, after they had this boot camp, then they would get some additional support after that. So again, we talked about the elbow to elbow, the learning collaborative, so that we would start off with regularly scheduled uh, group video conferences, um, and those would start off about every other week, and then as the practices got stronger, we had bumped that out to once a month. Uh, as we introduced new topics, we would go back to a more frequent basis. And during these uh, learning collaborative sessions, sites would help share the relevant data that they were collecting as they were starting to implement this and really share things that there were going on with them. And it was great because a lot of sites found out they had the same exact issues or other sites might have figured out how to work around that. So we were all ultimately learning from each other, which was really outstanding. Our website continues to help support sites. So we'll show you an example in a few minutes of what our website looks like. Uh, we continue to have the annual wellness video, and then we are in the process of creating an implementation toolkit, which I'll give you an example of what that looks like as well. So the elbow-to-elbow -elbow support, again, we worked with the teams elbow-to-elbow. -elbow. We would help them work uh, workflow development. We'd help uh, in their electronic medical record to figure out how they could use that to their advantage. Uh, my strength was in EPIC, but I was happy to work with other uh, electronic medical records and work with the IT department and get the ideas across, and they were able to help us figure out how to make that happen in the electronic medical record. We did some shadowing, so I had some nurses come out and watch me do the annual wellness visit. 
as well as I went and watched other nurses do the annual wellness visit. Actually, most of the nurses that came out to watch me do it were surprised because I immediately made them do it and I sat over their shoulders. So I wasn't going to let anybody have an easy ride here. Uh, and then we continued uh, mentoring. So again, we have lots of great information. Every time we present to somebody, we learn something. We go back and help support the other sites and give them that information. With the Learning Collaborative, again, this was our webinar sessions, and I just showed an example here of uh, the annual wellness visit, the one that currently is happening, and you can see the dates there and what the topic of the date was. And again, we would break the annual wellness visit down into pre-site, uh, pre-visit site readiness, pre-visit patient readiness, during the visit, and post-visit. So we had different sessions based around each one of those topics. So we'd have plenty of participants come on the webinars and we would run through this topic. Our website, again, this was really designed to uh, provide primary care practices with educational resources and important forms to conduct uh, the annual wellness visit. So uh, before um, Jeremiah had mentioned about the MINICOG and the MOCA, and so we could help provide that information to people and help educate them on how to go ahead and provide these, uh, these tests. So again, and then uh, information about our boot camp. So every time we did a boot camp, we listed our slides on the website so people uh, could go back and actually get uh, review that material. Uh, all the learning collaborative stuff was on there, so all the slides from the learning collaborative. And we actually went ahead and uh, recorded the learning collaboratives as well, so people could go back through and re-listen to it if they wanted to. Uh, and, and then uh, some abstracts, so we'll show you that in a few minutes. And again, the website, again, really works with how we educated, so with the pre-visit site readiness, patient readiness during the visit and post-visit, and then we had the video attached to the website as well. So this is sort of the home page of what our website looked like, and the website is nnegec.org, so that stands for Northern New England Geriatric Education Center. Uh, and you're able to access that, so if people are out there and they want to access it, they can. Um, we do ask that you just create a username and password so we can track who's using our information. We want to make sure we can uh, get some credit and reach out to people if we need to. And then on the left-hand side, you'll see there's some tabs there, and the Learning Collaborative tab is there, um, and you'll see the Annual Wellness Visit tab. So when you click on that Annual Wellness Visit tab, this is sort of what it looks like. And as you can see, the topics are broken down. The first part there is about our boot camps and any abstracts, so any of the information you're looking for from our previous boot camps. And then the information about the pre-visit, uh, site readiness, the patient readiness, the during the visit and post-visit. So links to the Department of Motor Vehicle, links to SASH, um, you know, how to go ahead and uh, write a letter to the Department of Motor Vehicles if you needed to uh, perhaps pull someone's driver's license. So we, we went ahead and did a lot of the work and made the links really easy for people to follow. We created a, an annual wellness visit annual wellness visit video. It's about an 18 minute video and again this sort of demonstrates uh, the nurse run annual wellness visit. Uh, it reviews the steps and key component, components. Uh, it demonstrates the cognitive and falls assessments that could be done during that and it discusses the importance of the after visit summary. This is the information that the patient should walk out of the door with after the visit. The implementation toolkit. Do you want to talk a little bit about this since this is your? Yeah, so part of this is, is <clears throat> some additional funding that we received actually to uh, focus on some team training. So that initial picture that, that Dan showed is kind of a still shot from videos that we created. So uh, part of this toolkit starts out with talking about, you know, team readiness and kind of the basics of team training, conflict resolution, um, and, in, and the videos really focus on how a practice is transforming around systems, around annual wellness visits, versus what most team training that's done is done around patients and how you come up with a care plan. But this is really about, again, this team transformation. Um, and so, again, the toolkit we've showed you 
specifically about the annual wellness visit, but the different chapters in the toolkit uh, include not only the quality improvement in the team training, but the AWV, CCM, chronic care management, dementia, and um, um, advanced care planning. We'll also uh, are, are going to start focusing on the transitional care management, um, so that's one thing that was really uh, important at Dartmouth. Um, so we'll be focusing on, on that next. Oh, somehow our highlight came undone here. But anyway, so this is just an example of one of the sections uh, in the playbook of the annual wellness visit uh, site readiness checklist. And so we just listed steps and what should be happening at each step. Uh, that little highlight, unfortunately, should be uh, around creating a workflow. So sorry, it's a little uh, off kilter there. So for example, if you need to know how to create a workflow, we ran you through the steps and then ultimately we hope you would produce a nice looking workflow like this. So you would have all the steps you needed to create that and this was one step of that whole section and we just listed those as a checkbox. You could go through and say, yep, did this, did that, and keep going through that. So some of our successes, and again, sorry, the graphics are off a little bit. Um, this was a, a poster we created um, with some of the information from uh, Jeremiah and his team as well. So in a three-month period of time, we took uh, 20 or 25 visits each month, so you had 75 visits in roughly three months. And we calculated it based on uh, mid-salary ranges for a physician and a mid-salary range for a nurse. And we gave the nurse an hour to do the annual wellness visit, and we gave the physician 30 minutes to do the annual wellness visit. And by taking the annual wellness visit out of the physician's hand and putting it in the nurse's hand, and having the physician do, for example, a 99214, which is probably the most common uh, code, uh, <laughs> code uh, written by physicians, uh, we were able to increase uh, revenue by 212% and increase RVUs by 190% in those three months. So again, lots of great positive stuff here. Um, just one example of not only patient care, but you could also make a little bit money to help justify. So I think if you really took some of this information back to a site, you could justify hiring a nurse just to go ahead and do some of these visits. We finally have nurses making income and having a huge impact on, on patient care, and I think that's really outstanding. Some of the lessons we learned, uh, Bringing the teams together was certainly uh, a challenge for us at times. Our first cohort, which did include uh, Montpelier here, um, we had other sites that really had some challenges having the right people sit at the table. Um, so really when it comes time to putting together your team, having everybody there, have a coder there, have a secretary there, have an MA there, have the nurse there, have the practice manager, have the champion there. Having all these people there is really important. One thing, I also sit on uh, an implementation support team at Dartmouth, and we are now rolling out TCM, and we have the computer IT people sitting at our table, and we meet with our teams from 12 to 1, and our computer people are on the line during that meetings, and then we meet with them from 1 to 2, and this is on a Tuesday, and we tell them what builds we need, and by Thursday, they're sending us emails telling us built and in the system, and it will be live in two weeks. Uh, so really, the people we never thought of before to have at that table. So the first cohort, again, with, with uh, Montpelier was involved, we didn't necessarily have those people there. Uh, in other practices, we had great ideas, and it took six to nine months to get some of this stuff built in the electronic medical record. So again, having the right people there, including some patient and family representatives are huge. Really having champions. We also found that for some larger institutions, uh, having a champion at each level, so have a, a champion for the MAs and a champion for the secretaries who could become your super users of this program and then go ahead and help, help educate the additional staff, but also be there as a local resource uh, was, Unofficial. Again, I was putting lots of miles on my car, so we really needed to start supporting 
uh, in-house championships. Um, and one thing we're really finding now is the collaboratory learning that we're doing with the, with the webinars. This has been huge. We're getting almost biweekly instant feedback from sites and we're learning their challenges and other sites are able to learn from everyone else's challenges and share that information. Uh, that was one of our hopes initially with GWEP that we would learn stuff and we would help share that stuff with other people and we would learn stuff from them and share it with the other people. So, and the coaching and support, again, very helpful to have. And again, I think we're gonna hold the questions. Uh, Ellen, do you have any last minute no. remarks? Okay, great. So, as we move forward, um, we, as Dan has been talking about, we have an ongoing learning collaborative and we're very interested in recruiting additional practices um, to participate in, an, in another learning collaborative um, that will start um, and probably in the next um, two months. Um, so again, please email us if you have more questions or are interested. Um, the way that we uh, rolled out this learning collaborative is we would actually have sites present for the kickoff, for the boot camps, but we've recognized that that's a real challenge for rural practices. It's a real challenge for small practices to be able to give up staff when often it was half the, the team in the primary care site. Um, so we will be doing those boot camps um, electronically as well. Um, and so I think it provides an opportunity for, again, rural practices. Um, you will still have uh, Dan virtually, which is great. Um, and, and, and I think as we pilot this moving forward, we, um, it's really about the relationships. It's the relationships we've developed with the practices and really being able to help them and also the relationships that they have with other practices as well. Um, so we, um, you know, we invite you to uh, inquire or to consider uh, joining the Learning Collaborative. Um, and again, you have our information and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Ellen. Once again, Ellen is the co-director of Dartmouth Centers for Health and Aging, and we're really pleased you could join us today. Thank you. So thank you, Dan. That was great. I'm sure you all have questions, and we'll just um, let Ellen um, do her presentation, and then we're um, happy to uh, post questions to this group. So Liz, are you um, ready? I am. Great. So I am Liz Sheehan. I am a nurse at Ottaquichi Health Center, which is part of the Mount Scutney Hospital primary practice. Um, I am joining you from Woodstock today, so down here. Um, I've been a nurse for about seven years now. I've been at this clinic for now about four years um, as an RN. And next slide, please. So an overview of our clinic, we do have six providers at Adequichi, one nurse practitioner, one PA, two pediatricians, and then two internists as well. Um, we have six staff members, six nursing staff members, uh, three RNs, one LPN, one LNA, and one CMA currently. We also have two community health team members that join us throughout the week. And then for specialists, we have psychiatry here for two days a week and also podiatry for two days a week. We do also have a physical therapy office in the downstairs of our building. So kind of a That's great. complete model. Yeah. And we are also using, so for our nursing staff members, we're using a, more of a team model. So we have a couple nurses that just do primarily flow. Um, putting patients in, vital signs, point of care testing, um, a phones and triage nurse, a pre-visit planning and prescription refill nurse. So we're kind of working in that type of model. And next slide. So my role um, before we were in the first cohort of the GWEP program was kind of lead nurse. I had some administrative duties as well. I was walk-in triage nurse, phone triage nurse, did prescription renewals and rooming patients. So kind of on a 
um, on and off basis doing all of those things. Now I'm still doing most of those things, but also doing annual wellness visits as well. So next slide. And so for the future, we're hoping to just have me doing the annual wellness visits and more of the chronic care management visits, so COPD follow-ups, hypertension, and diabetes education. So that is the hope for the future. So for training on the annual wellness visits, we participated in the first cohort of the GWEP program. So we went to the boot camp um, and using the toolkits, still continually using the toolkits. Um, I did do the in-office training with Dan, so yes, he did too, and then unbeknownst to me, I did one as well at that visit. Um, and then <laughs> also, just do one already was my, um, we had a liaison, Debbie, from GWEP, and so that was kind of the push that I needed to do one at our practice. So I did three before she came um, just to do them. And then the training is just ongoing, continual fine-tuning of the whole process. Um, like Dan said, patient input along the way is crucial, um, absolutely crucial, very important part of it. And next slide. So what it looks like in our office is that we send out a letter to the patient that they're due for their annual visit with the doctor, including an annual wellness visit with the nurse. So we have, ours is combined. We have the patient schedule for one hour with the nurse, and then directly after that, schedule a half hour with the provider. Um, we did that because we were finding the first couple that I did were not together, and the patients really just wanted to see their provider as well. So we decided to combine them, and so far that has been working well. They are in the office for more of a prolonged time, um, but I'm finding very few of the annual wellness visits that do not need a follow-up with the doctor, so it just makes it convenient for the patient to be here and see both the nurse and the provider. Um, at check-in, the patient is given a health risk assessment. It's a shorter health risk assessment than what is on the GWEP toolkit um, because we found that within our annual wellness visit template in our computer system, there was a lot of the questions that I was kind of double asking. So we kind of shortened the health risk assessment I see the patient, I do a soft handoff to the provider, noting any issues that the provider should follow up on uh, with the patient, and then the provider goes in to see the patient. So this is um, just a sheet that I made up myself to kind of use as that soft handoff because usually it's in the hall as they're going in, so it's kind of clear that these are the concerns that the patient has. It has the PHQ score, GAD score, mini-COG, or the slumps or MOCA, whichever, um, and any health maintenance issues that were addressed. And next slide. So the benefits that we found, um, more one-on-one -on -one time spent with the patients talking about prevention and lifestyle, increased their satisfaction. We haven't done any formal um, satisfaction ratings, but just from the things that I've heard from what patients say to the doctors, to myself, and to front desk staff is they really like that one-on-one -on -one devoted time um, talking to the nurse. It also allows more education for patients surrounding chronic health problems and identified health and risk factors. It also frees up providers time to see more of the acute chronic medical issues and then also allows the nurses to work at the top of their license. So I can say that for myself, I have really enjoyed working at the top of my license and, and doing these annual wellness visits on a daily, weekly basis. Next 
So I think one of the biggest challenges for us was patient buy-in to this. Um, we have one provider whom the patients all love, and they just want to see their provider for their annual physical. Um, so that was hard. So it took um, me making a lot of phone calls and talking to patients, I think just like Tina has been doing, um, just kind of explaining. And also for the doctor, if they, you know, flat out refuse to come in for an annual wellness visit, having the doctor educate them during that follow-up visit and, and them being fine with it after. And understanding the difference between the annual wellness visit and the annual physical, that has been the biggest both for staff and for patients, kind of, um, because they all want that annual physical from their, their doctor. And then also training the support staff just for insurance questions and scheduling. We had some snafus with that, so it's an ongoing challenge and just trying to um, get it right. And next slide. So I have done, since I started my first annual wellness visit last August, so it's been almost a year, so far have performed 127 annual wellness visits, and I'm hoping for more this year. And then also I'm in the process of um, a GERO nurse prep class to become a board-certified um, gerontologist. So I'm looking into that as well. Wonderful. And that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, Liz. It's fairly nice to hear from the nurse perspective, and we're happy to hear have Tina in the room here, too. Um, Tina, before we take questions, do you have anything else you'd like to ask in terms of your perspective or job satisfaction? Job satisfaction certainly has increased for me. I enjoy working with the patients. I was in an administrative role in the office. I was the coordinator in the office prior to that. Part of our challenge was finding someone to do the um, administrative role in the office so that I could be freed up to do the wellness visits. Um, so I really enjoy um, the time that I'm spending with the patients, and I enjoy um, the patient education that I'm able to provide also. And it sounds like you're getting feedback that the patients really appreciate that too. Great. I want to just make one comment before we start in on questions, and, and that is that, um, Liz, you, you, you made a really good point about how having that visit with the PCP scheduled right after the annual wellness visit makes a lot of sense in terms of patient satisfaction. One of the potential disadvantages to doing that is that in, in our model, when Tina's ordering a test, for example, um, a bone density scan or an ultrasound or a mammogram or something, the results of the testing isn't completed by the time the PCP sees the patient. And so then that potentially generates a third visit, which some patients have griped about. Mm -hmm. um, by splitting them up in our practice and doing them later, we're able to get the data back and then review the data at the follow-up visit with the PCP. So I think there's, there's definitely some, you know, there's different ways to do it advantages and disadvantages to both models. I think it's a matter of figuring out what works best. It's probably not one shoe fits all sizes. It's We've actually had a few where they've seen me and then seen you or, or seen Rima um, because of an acute issue mm -hmm. that they wanted addressed that day. And I looked and said, oh, there's space in the schedule. <laughs> and just were able to slide them in. And so you're right, they would have revisit, but they were aware of that and okay with that. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments you panelists would like to make before we open it up? Nope. Great. Um, well, thank you very much. How about questions from those on the phone? Uh, this, is, this is Norm Ward. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, if you do it on the same day, nurse followed by uh, APP or doctor, um, are you billing a 25 modifier for the doctor and the G code for the annual wellness visit? Looking for a primer on billing for this. 
Yes, so, the answer is yes. You can. Yes. Yeah. You can build Go ahead, both. Sam. Sorry, sorry, Liz. You can build both on the same day. So yes. With that modifier, twenty-five. Yes. Yeah. Great. And the wellness visit would never be in the 25 modifier position. It would be the primary service and the APP or physician visit would always be the, the E&M that was the 25 modifier separately billable event. Do you ever see it the other direction? I don't know. Okay. And you just have to be sure that you're meeting all the criteria for your E&M code, you know, making sure that you've addressed all those points. Right. One of the keys about doing both visits on the same day is each note has to support themselves, right? So the modifier, so your 99214, cannot use information from the annual wellness visit to help support that code. Uh, each, each code has to be able to support itself. Do you all feel comfortable with us sharing these slides with people? Yeah, sure. Great. We do have one question about uh, being able to download the PowerPoint slides. I think, I think that is something we'd be happy to yeah. send you yeah. in a PDF if you'd like to just email us and request that or let us know who's asked that question. Um, I did not mention previously that we um, were also uh, recording this session because there were many that were not able to join us today but were interested in it. And so um, they might be interested in the slides as well. Liz, I'm sorry I was jumping a little fast on that slide. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely fine. Your Thank you for doing it. You bet. So just a quick comment. So uh, Liz has become... Uh, so famous now too because she is actually the nurse in our annual wellness video. So oh. uh, if you want to see how good Liz is, you can check out our website and look at the video. <laughs> so if people um, go to that website, the n n e g e c dot org that you had, and then sign in, the the video is also available to them. Mm -hmm. Yep, video and all our tools and the PowerPoint presentations. Uh, you know, we would prefer somebody, if they're interested in the program, to actually join the program. Like anything, you can pick up a book on how to play the piano, but to try to play the piano without somebody helping you is a little tough. So um, being part of the program, being at the boot camps, having the support is really what it's all about. Um, but the information is available. It does sound like you offer a lot of support, and both Liz and Jeremiah's groups you know, worked with you to do this, didn't they? We couldn't have done it without it. We could say that louder. <laughs> we couldn't have done it without Dan. He was really supportive. Um, he would, we could fly. It. So. I would say that I've done, this is Jeremiah, I've done a lot of quality improvement projects in our practice. And I would say that this was one of the most enjoyable quality improvement projects because of the support that we received through the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Project. It just made everything so much smoother. Um, we didn't have to keep track of it, you know, as many details because someone was facilitating it and keeping track of those things. And I, I can't recommend it enough. So this is Susan. Jeremiah, didn't you also share with me that it was um, really well received by your practice and that it was sort of a win-win? You know, nurse, there's nursing satisfaction, patient, uh, and maybe improvement on what you're capturing, um, the providers liked it, and even the finance people. Yeah, is that right? really, this is this okay. satisfies not just the triple aim, but the, not even the quadruple aim, it's the quin, quintuple <laughs> aim <laughs> of right. improving the bottom line, saving money, doing preventative care, having everybody satisfied. And, and just to, to go over a, a bit about the, the learning collaborative, so initially we had calls bi-weekly, so folks were expected to participate in the calls every two weeks, and that was really to get people in their groove of what to expect on the calls. And the calls literally follow the implementation guide, which is also kind of a playbook. So we go through each play during the call and really help people step by step in really baby steps. 
um, the calls have now been reduced to once a month. So that's really your level of participation. I don't want to, uh, um, you know, minimize the amount of work that it takes to do this because it does take work, but the actual participation uh, um, in the learning collaborative um, is really is really minimal. Um, so, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I will just add a comment too. You know, I, I did mention that at One Care we were very interested in this, and that our um, rates were really low. You know, certainly there was variation. There were providers in the network that had 80 percent um, performance, and then there were some that were very, very low. And I think a lot of those low ones, um, from my recollection, were actually specialists that were winning attribution to patients. So what's interesting is that if um, if a beneficiary from Medicare has a primary care or PCP code visit so that they were seen by a PCP, um, they would win that attribution. You know, the, the patient is aligned with the PCP office. So this means if the attrib attributed provider is the cardiologist or the ophthalmologist, it means that that patient is not, has not been seen by their PCP. So that's another group for us to target, to be able to notify people that there are these patients that are not seeing their PCP because we know cardiologists are not doing these exams or these visits, right? And, and also, it, it does mean that um, you know, we, we could continue to, to have them be attributed if indeed they came in and saw their um, primary care doc. The other thing I should mention is that as of 2017, Medicare or CMS has allowed those advanced practice, um, the, the PAs and the um, NPs, to win attribution for patients when they do things like this. Up until that time, that was not the case, so we're pleased with that change. But the one little caveat is that they, um, uh, your nurse practitioner does this, there has to be a PCP visit sometime within that 12 months in order for them to win the attribution and you know, be considered one of our patients. So for any practices that are having, you know, not your RNs, but your NPs doing all of this, it's important that that patient might see an MD some point during the year as well. Does that make sense? Other questions for those of you on the phone? So, so this is Norm again, the, the, while we're trying to read the small print. Um, in terms of the, the uh, elephant in the room, uh, I've heard that pharmacists, LPNs, can conceivably do the annual wellness visit. Can anybody address that? Yep. So uh, pharmacists can do that, and an LPN, assuming they're licensed and uh, able to practice in their scope, per their facility are able to do this as well. So again, Medicare has those, uh, you know, the incident two rules and all their, uh, you know, whatever the lawyers happen to write, but uh, have looked at that pretty finely. And uh, so as long as they're licensed and practicing within their scope and practicing in the scope of the facility that they work for, they're eligible to uh, participate in that visit. That's the same thing with uh, CCM as well, the chronic care management. So one of the things that, that we started to, way before we, we wrote this grant that concerned us was that um, that the minute clinics were rolling this out. So CVS was going to roll this out nationally in a very big way. And for all of us in primary care, the kind of the hair on the back of your neck goes up like, really, this is not being done in primary care? Like, how is this connecting? How is this actually? Centered medical home, you know, let us know this information. I and mean, how is this Im improving patient care? One of the things that we've also thought about is there's really almost nothing in the literature about looking at uh, patient outcomes from the annual wellness visit. And so that's a question that's asked all the time, and it's a great question. Um, so those of us certainly intuitively know that if you get somebody into a false prevention program and you identify cognitive impairment and down the, the line, 
we know that that is ultimately going to have an impact on that patient, but actually trying to measure that is a challenge, but we're going to try. Yeah, so if anybody wants to give us three or four million dollars, uh, we'd be happy to, <laughs> to uh, write, a, write a grant on that. <laughs> We have a comment here that's come in um, that says um, that uh, they wanted to thank the presenters for mentioning SASH. Um, can you all hear me? I've sort of I'm further from the microphone. But um, the, um, the message says that they would like to thank presenters for mentioning this SASH and um, our work together, and that they would like to offer that um, SASH could be helping with the and the participants with the difference between the, the Medicare annual wellness visit <coughs> at uh, IPPE or an annual physical um, because they can reach a large group easily. And I think that would be really a great idea. I think the more education, the better. So one of the things that, um, that is happening, certainly at Dartmouth in the South, is as we participate in NextGen, we'll be able to, um, to, do the, to use uh, telehealth to do the annual wellness visits. But as you know, you need somebody to take the vital signs. So we're actually looking at some models of how we would use community health workers or care coordinators to actually go into the home, take the vital signs, and Skype to us in the office. Um, so I think that there is certainly promise in that. And, you know, we're also doing this at the assisted living facilities, and, you know, we have a home care practice. So I think it would be brilliant to think about how we can, you know, again, involve SASH and do this. Certainly they've been involved in helping us think about how the Vermont practices, you know, work closely with SASH um, and how we can help that. But I think there's absolutely additional roles for sure. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I do have a question really for Jeremiah, but perhaps you others too, um, and Tina. If, if Tina sees a patient and sort of sends you a note, what does that mean? That note documented, you know, is her visit documented in the chart and then you would open it up? Or is there some other mechanism where she's sending you these? Well, I document the note and I also take and I will send the, the highlights, which Dr. Eckhouse showed you in the um, slides. Um, so that gives him, this is the summary. The summary of what the position he also can read my entire note with all the screenings and all the health and risk assessments and all of that. Great. And you have it built into your um, electronic medical records so that the patient would leave with that whole list of screenings. And uh, the patient leaves with a visit summary. My visit summary includes my plan of care for him or her the referrals that I've done, the tests that I've ordered, um, the follow-up that is needed for any of their uh, chronic illnesses, um, and um, any follow-up that they need to have with their clinicians. Great. And so their list of sort of screening that are um, important in the next five to ten years, is that something you hand them, or is that part it's of that? It's part of the visit summary. Great. Uh, so that summary, the, the, not the visit, not the after visit summary, but the little synopsis comes to me as a phone encounter, which just means that I have to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> for one thing, I can't not look at it. It's in my list of things to look at, and um, and then I address it, and it becomes part of the note, part of the patient's chart. So there's a record of that as well. And if there's something that I recommend for follow up, or I may. Um, I may suggest a different diagnosis, for example, for a patient. Um, I can then send that right back to Tina, and she can amend the note or change the note or whatever. So it becomes a part of the permanent record. So this is Dan Moran. So a question just came across uh, the, the chat line here about can a practice send a nurse to a patient's home to do the AWV uh, while the doc's back at the, the clinic? The answer is no. Uh, this is incident to uh, supervision, so the a doc or the nurse practitioner PA has to be available on site. And so we even initially thought about, great, let's let's get an RV and park it in a grocery store parking lot and, and pound out 100 uh, AWVs and uh, 
apparently we can't do that. Uh, <laughs> so if you see our RV, uh, we're, we're now repainting it. Um, so you can't do that as well. One other. Um, but we did. But we have done this in an assisted living facilities. So if the dock is there, so it has a session in an assisted living facility, the doc's on site or the nurse practitioner's on site, then the nurse comes in and does the annual wellness visit. Yeah, so that's interesting. Any site that has a sniffist, doctor or NP, could do this model. Yep. So one one thing we really found quite interesting when we started off, and uh, what we ran data on all the sites that we initially started working with, and we had one site shining, doing tons of annual wellness visits, and we were so impressed. Um, until we talked to the billers, because the, the coders and billers were not auditing any of the AWVs walking out the door. And I don't know if we did this site good or bad by sort of saying, you know, well, here's an audit tool. You should randomly check a couple of these notes. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, the numbers really significantly fell in that site. Uh, so even though we're billing AWVs and they're walking out the door as an annual wellness visit, doesn't mean it's truly an annual wellness visit. Half of these were physicals, and even if you're underbilling or overbilling, it's still Medicare fraud. So you have to be careful of that. So again, just because you're billing these as AWVs, uh, you really want to make sure you're using some form of an audit tool to check to make sure all the components are there uh, before sending these out the door. We don't. Uh, and again, this is one of the most common errors done by uh, a physician visit is they have so much else to do that they don't really have time to hit on some of these smaller components, so. Great. So this is Norm again. In terms of the uh, hierarchical condition category coding and uh, for risk adjusting your patient population, uh, I may have missed this because I came in late, but in terms of the, the RN, seeing and talking with the patient, are they teeing up problems that are existent on the problem list, are they at times creating a new problem that may then get subsequently, um, you know, reinforced or confer affirmed by the NP or doctor? Absolutely. Yeah. I take and I um, use existing problems and make sure that they're following up on those correctly, and we have that all protocoled through the office, so that makes it easy for me to make recommendations. For example, diabetics, if their A1C is greater than 7, they're supposed to come in every three months. If it's less than 7, they come in every six months. So I put that as part of their plan. Um, if they uh, do a tug uh, test or time up and go test, and they fail that miserably, I will take, and maybe it's the instability of their gait that I'm seeing. Um, maybe they're, I'm saying, boy, I'm really dizzy while I'm up, and it's vertigo that they're having with movement. Um, those sorts of things I will take and put in a um, telephone encounter to the doctor saying, these are my observations. I've done a referral. Um, and the doctor then can say, yes, I agree with you, thanks, or can take and say, gee, I wouldn't use this. I would use something else. Great. That's not very good. That's syncope or something like that. Yeah. But she's adding diagnoses to the list. But, but they don't get into the billing queue. Without, the, without get, the diagnosing person, right? right. They're Dr. just going to the problem list, not right. the billing. Dr. Eckhouse has to sign off, or yeah. whoever doing it for has to sign off on anything that I um, observe. Great. I have um, a quick question. If no one on the phone does, you um, you all commented about how it's it's. Um, challenging for patients who would like to think about annual physicals. Um, I wonder if there's been any um, work with your panel to target um, those people just turning 65, so they're just entering Medicare, 
and they would they would be new to all of this. So you know, you sort of train them like this is the way we do it. And also that initial visit is you know more like one hundred and eighty eight dollars instead of one hundred and twenty or something. Is there any thought about that? No, it's a good thought. I mean, that initial visit, correct me if I'm wrong, can't be done by the RN. The IPPE cannot be done by an RN. That has to be done by a physician because there is a physical. But the initial annual wellness visit can be done by a nurse, and so can the subsequent. But the IPPE, depending on what you were asking about when you said initial, the IPPE is a physician or associate provider or whatever, um, where the initial annual wellness visit can be a nurse. So I guess you target the 66-year-old. So actually, who hadn't had the in, in my panel, I start approaching people even as they're starting to hit 64 because I want to make sure they're getting some of the screening stuff that care doesn't cover before they lose their insurance. And I say, oh, by the way, when you turn 65, here's what we're going to be doing. Uh, uh, annual wellness visit. And I'm already prepping them and giving them this information. So now when they turn 65, they can get the IPPE. And then when they turn 66, there's no questions. We've already had the conversation a couple of times. So uh, easy sell for me going forward because uh, I'm planting the seed every single time I see my patients in their uh, mid-60s. I'm already top telling them about all of That's a really big help to me doing the visit with the clinicians selling us. Um, when they take and they prep the patients and the patients say, oh, this is what I'm coming in for, and it's cheesier than taking and I always call it after the horse is out of the barn, you take and have to rein them back and say, oh, we can't do it this way, we're going to do it. <coughs> and then that is a different level of satisfaction. Exactly. Yeah. Usually right. they're happy after the visit. And they say, oh, Dr. Eckhouse never did this with me sort of thing. But it's, um, it's much easier when he's talked to them before I've seen them. And it is. It really is great. Thank you. And so for Liz and Tina, your repeat customers, I, I know you neither of you have been doing this quite exactly a year long yet, but when you tell your patient, hey, I'd like to do this again next year, what is their response? Is it a well, I'm really not sure, or is it a yes, or a maybe, or? I've been getting positive positive feedback. They've been really um, very happy um, with the service, and they see value in it. And I explain to them how we go about it. For example, the advanced directive, if they don't have one, um, I plant the seed to get them one. And if they have one, I actually print the copy of their advanced directive and we review it at the time of the appointment. And is that still current? And a lot of them are really interested in those mini cogs and mochas. Yep. They're the very mocha. Everyone concerned loves the mocha. about that. <laughs> and Liz, your experience with that when you ask patients to come back uh, next year for this, what, is, what kind of response are you getting? That they definitely want to come back and do it again just because of that one on one dedicated time that we spent together. And also, I'm seeing um, husband and wife couples like, oh, my wife will love to come in for this, or my, I'm going to make my husband make a visit <laughs> in the next <laughs> So I'm, I'm seeing that as well, too, which is great. Excellent. Thanks for the input, Liz. That's wonderful. I have an eye on the clock, and I see that we're coming up to 6.30, and we said that uh, that would be our end point. I, I would like, before we leave, just to remind um, those on the phone that um, OneCare does have an uh, annual wellness visit toolkit that's on our phone. Um, you're welcome to um, see what's there. The idea, again, was to try to make it easy and give you some samples of scripts and um, forms and checklists. Um, but I would like to thank the panelists for coming today, Jeremiah, Dan, Ellen, Liz. Thank you very much. Thank but, you. Um, I and hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. What was the uh, what was the website name for for Gwep's website? Yeah, for the uh, toolkit and examples of things. Oh, well, I was just mentioning if you go on um, One Care Vermont website, um, there is, uh, and you would have to log in, 
um, there is a sample of um, our toolkit. And for the dark folks, um, if you go to N N E G E C, am I right about that? Org. Yep. org. So there, there it is. You go. Thank you. Um, I think you also have to register for that or put in your email address. Yep. And um, all of their tools and information is there. You know, a lot of it, I can speak for ourselves, a lot of it is linking you to what CMS has published. It's sort of allowed or required. And then there's some other resources. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You bet. Thank you. And thank you all very much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. You bet.